Awesome. I'm really excited to be up here with you guys, and I'm going to be speaking around the, the discipline or the practice of reflection. So let's get into it. And I've grown up to be, a, I've grown in the last few years to be a quite an anti-hype kind of person. Now, it doesn't help because my girlfriend's all about the hype and she gets excited, but when Christmas comes around, it feels like it's super hyped, like the build-up to Christmas. And it, it gets me so, dis- I get so disappointed in myself because I end up getting caught up in the hype. Like, I want to go to the shops, I want to buy stuff with money that I don't have, I want to like, I want to, I just want to do all the things Christmassy, and then I get so disappointed in myself because I get to Christmas... And then I've created this expectation in my head, and then Christmas just lets me down. Like, it's not all that. I don't know. Does anyone ever feel like that? One or two people. Okay. And to make matters worse, I think the build-up in Chris, uh, for Christmas in Durban and in Schlanger is horrible. Like, I hate it. And let me tell you why. If you can bear with me for a moment while I be the Grinch, I want to unpack, <laughs> unpack why... I struggle with the build-up to Christmas and in Umschlange and in Durban. Now, I, do, I, I believe our city is wonderful, but there are a few things that really get to me. So the first one is the amount of GP cars that come into Durban <laughs> really can get, to, it can get to me. It feels like every single person uh, from Gauteng want to come and have a holiday in Durban. Now, if, if there's anyone from GP today, like, we're so glad that you're here. We want you here. <laughs> like, like, hey, like, Dur- like, I don't blame you for being in Durban. I think we live in one of the best cities in the country, if not the world. We have the best weather. So just be careful, because you might end up staying like Ryan, and now he's the <laughs> campus pastor at Riverside. So just know that our city is very beautiful and exciting. But to be honest, it's not the GP drivers or the cars that are the problem. You actually drive much better than Durban. Now. It's like, we're useless, and, and we can fight after the service with that. But the thing that really gets me are the whoever designed our road system just made a killing and then left. Now, I don't know if any of you ever struggle with this, but have you ever sat in traffic by Gateway? Have you ever sat in traffic in Durban? I feel like whoever designed it didn't anticipate the influx of people that would come and haunt our city during the Christmas period. And what happens is there's just traffic and traffic and traffic, and I hate traffic. Do any of you hate traffic? Yeah? No one likes traffic. I hate traffic so much. <laughs> then the second thing that I, that I love about Durban, but I also hate it at the same time, is the heat and humidity. Oh my goodness, like Durban, you're a beautiful place. Like 20, but like, like we all want to go to this beach paradise, but 24 7, I hate it. I can't deal with the humidity every second of my life. That's why I wear black. Probably why Ryan has a sweat. I sweat, you don't see that I'm struggling. <laughs> That's why I wear black, to be honest. I'm self conscious. So, what happened, like, and what even gets to me a bit more is that when, we, when it's humid, it really makes people grumpy. And it makes people generally not nice people. If you ever want to see the heart of a Christian, find them in a humid place. Like, you'll see, like, you'll see their heart. But what happens is then people get hot and they get sweaty. They're in their car. Their aircon's not working. Then they do dumb things. They say dumb things to other people. Then they become grumpy. And it just creates this cycle of grumpiness and negativity. And what happens is then you start, you start going home and you're grumpy. And then you start going to work and you're grumpy. You then go to my personal favorite, which is the third thing. You go to the shopping centers and you're grumpy. Now, can you imagine a whole shopping center that is grumpy with no air con because there's load shedding? The worst place to be ever. (laughs) I hate shopping centers during December, and I want to say to every single person, go shop in November, October, the rest of the year. I want to say that, but I can't because I went shopping on Friday night at Gateway and managed to find stuff, and I hated every moment, not every moment, I was nice to spend time with friends, but being in the shops were just driving me crazy. They were driving me crazy. So what happens is, is all three of these things start like causing this perpetual cycle of chaos, like we've been mentioning. Like, we, look, let's use this gateway for an example. It's hot, you go in a gateway, you get aircon. There's load shedding, now I need a shop, and now everyone smells, everyone's grumpy. And then, oh, I can't even get into gateway because the traffic is so bad. And then you just hate life. But after the day... When we, 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 we feel like we've managed to do everything, it's like 11 o'clock at night, you're like tired from the day, and you're lying in bed with only your thoughts. You start reflecting on your day, and you're like, hey, this was really cool, I really enjoyed this, or this sucked, or whatever. And then you start, you know when you start going a bit deeper, like you go a bit more deeper than surface level day, you go, oh, my 2019, it was so good. Like, I, I, I found a job, I found, a, like, I found someone that loves me for once, um, but then you start going even further, and you're like, oh my gosh, but like I lost my dad, I, I, I lost this, this didn't happen, a breakup occurred, and then the negatives seem to just keep piling up. 
And we get to this place where we start to ask God, like, hey, actually, where were you, God, in this whole thing? You seemed invisible to me. Where have you been, God, this whole 2019? It's almost like we think that Jesus has got up and left Durban because he can't handle the hoarded shops and the, and the humidity and the traffic, and he's gone to the Drakensberg and he's just left us. And we feel like he's invisible. The, the, the Christmas chaos consumes us like, so much that we look at Jesus, but we think that he's invisible and that he doesn't care about us. We get so distract, distracted by that. And today, I want to speak about how we can make God more visible by opening up our hearts and opening up our eyes to feel and see Him in front of us. So today, I want to read an account. I want to read it from the book of Luke, so you find that in the New Testament. If you've got your Bible, I really just want you to start turning there. If not, the words are on the screen, but I believe this. It's so nice to just read a normal book. Um, So if you want to follow with me, um, it's Luke chapter 10, verse 38 to 42. And it's about Martha and Mary. And if you haven't heard about Martha and Mary, it's the first time that you will encounter them in the book of Luke. I hope otherwise I am a heretic in what I'm saying, but you were meeting them for the first time. And um, let's go through this together. But before, I just want to pray um, that God would reveal some stuff to us as we read the scripture. So can you bow your heads with me? Jesus, we're so grateful uh, for your word. We're grateful for the words that you've spoken. We thank you that we have access to this book, that we can reflect on who you are and that we can, you can speak to us. So I pray that these words that are spoken today, Lord, that it would land on soft hearts. And I pray for soft hearts so that we can take this and be able to live it out in our everyday. So we thank you and we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, I'm going to read the scripture in its entirety, and then I'm going to go through word for word. Uh, Not word for word, line by line. Um, So let's go. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. But the Lord said to her, My dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. So if we go back to the first line, it says, As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. So Jesus and his 12 disciples were going on their way back to Jerusalem. Essentially, they had been on the wildest mission trip of their life. If you don't know what a mission trip is, it's basically when Christians leave their hometown to go to other places to to tell people about Jesus and show their love of Jesus and hope that they may uh, have a relationship with him and discover him. So they've gone on this wild, the wildest mission trip of their life, and they were probably shook at what Jesus had done. Like, they would have seen some crazy things, and I want to share some of the things that they would have experienced. They would have experienced um, healing. They would have seen people who were paralyzed begin to get up and walk. Like, that's crazy. They would have seen blind people see for the first time. They would have seen Jesus cast out demons, very casual. Then they would have heard the, the most famous sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount. If there was YouTube back then, it probably would have racked up the most views for the best sermon in history. This one's nuts. He rose a boy from the dead. and I mean, I don't know if you've seen a boy lately being raised from the dead, but they saw a boy risen from the dead. Then Jesus proceeds to defy the laws of physics and defy the laws of mathematics, and he feeds 5,000 people with with five loaves of bread and two fish. I still can't wrap my head around that one. And then lastly, Jesus literally calms a storm when the disciples were in, in, in trouble. That's, he calmed the weather. That's literally like him coming this week to Durban and say, rain, stop, everyone go to the beach. That's literally what he would have done. It's safe to say that this mission trip was quite insane. I wish I could have gone on that. So after the mission trip, they, they're making their way back down to Jerusalem, and it's probably quite a far walk. They've been, they've been, they're probably excited, they're a bit tired, and they realize, hey, I think we need a break. Let's have a pit stop. Let's go to Martha's house. Now, according to some commentaries, Martha was a widow, and she ran some sort of guest house. So Jesus rocks up. I, I mean, I don't know how he would have done it. Like, knock, knock. Hi, Martha. Can we stay with you? And Martha just says, sure, come in. But the reality is when you let Jesus in, you also let his disciples and his followers in as well. So basically, Martha was caring for 13 sweaty young lads who had just been walking and been like hungry and on this mission trip. 
where Jesus went, there's probably always a bit of a party where all these people went. So the text goes on to say this. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. So there's three things in this line that I want to address. The first one is, so Martha had a younger sister by the name of Mary. She probably, if it was a guest house, like the commentary said, they would have helped. Um, she would have helped in the house when attending to the guests. But we see in this case that she's chilling in the lounge, sitting at Jesus' feet, just listening to what he has to say. In some, in some uh, resources it says, that, or sorry, some translations that he actually was teaching her stuff. So it must have been some stuff he was teaching the disciples. But while all this was happening, Martha was busy getting everything prepared. So now that was the second thing that I was curious about. was the, What would the preparations have looked like for Martha? And I think it would have probably looked like this. So there were 13 young guys. Guys get hungry. She would have had to have fed 13 guys on the spot. Now, I, like my mom panics when she has to feed my brother and I, and we're just two people. Now imagine Martha having to feed 13 guys. Then she has to find 13 beds for these oaks to sleep in. And if it was a guest house, hopefully we had 13. But I don't know about you, but during Christmas, you know when family comes down and you're like, oh, I'm going to have the best sleep in the holidays. And then you get shafted to the couch with a blow-up mattress. <laughs> hey? Yeah, there's a few people. I know that feeling. That happens to me. And then this one would have probably had to have happened. Martha would have had to fill like bowls or buckets of water so that Jesus and his disciples could wash their feet. Because it was custom back then that before dinner and before bed, you would wash your feet for two reasons. Because probably they smelled. That's not one of the reasons, but they smelled. Um, that you would have walked in the, in the house barefoot and it would have got dusty. So you would wa- wash it before bed because you, didn't wanna, you don't want to get it on your sheets. And then the second one is you're busy cruising around in like open toe sandals, like those Jerusalem cruisers. And you're busy walking around and you're walking in the dirt and there's probably like animal feces because those are the merchant paths that you're walking on. And you get in the house, you just want to wash your feet. So that's what what Martha was probably preparing. Then the third thing was that she was distracted by her preparations. How often during Christmas do we get distracted by all the preparations that have to be done? Hey, how often? Like we get distracted by the things like we need to make food, we need to get the gammon, we need to get the turkey, we need to make sure that our house is clean for all the guests, we need to get all the presents in December. But I want to say, I don't think what Martha was doing was actually bad. I think it was actually really good. She was essentially being hospitable and caring for Jesus. I mean, if Jesus walked into your house, we would make sure we had fig tree coffee ready. We would make sure we had a Rocco Mama's burger for the whole squad there waiting. Hey, we would make sure that we had the best beds. No blow-up mattresses for Jesus. Like, we would sleep on the floor. And we would have the best water, Woolworths water, washing his feet. Like, we would, we would get them ready. But the question is, was this the most important thing that Martha should be doing at this time? The text goes on to say, she came to him and asked, Lord, okay, wait, I need to read this with more sass. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work for myself? Tell her to help me. I don't think I nailed it, but... Um, <laughs> This is honestly my favorite part of the passage. Like Martha is super sassy with Jesus now and telling him what to do. I don't know about you, how often I do, we tell Jesus what he needs to do, how he should run the world, how he should do things. So often we tell him how to do things. And the second thing is, I really relate to her because she's an older sibling, right? I'm an older brother. And if you can bear with me, I want to tell you a story. Who's who's an older sibling here? Okay, you're the chosen ones. Well then, you're getting to heaven. Um, (laughs) You're going to know where I'm going with this when I tell you. Any younger siblings? Shame. Um, joking. Um, you're going to know why this is going to be so funny. Any middle children? Like you're not forgotten. You've probably experienced both. And then any only children? Ashley, put up your hand. Any only children? Okay, you probably might have had to have done all the things. Now, my brother, Brett, and myself, when we were young, we used to love playing with Lego and with our action figures uh, all day, like we got excited. And then at some point, we had to pack all the stuff away because we couldn't leave it on the floor. So Dylan's busy packing all his toys away and realized that Brett's not there. And after some time, I'm like, this isn't fair. This is very unjust. Let me go find Brett. So I'll go find Brett, and then I'll say, Brett, in the nicest way, probably not, but in the nicest way, please come help me clean up what you also played with. After much defiance, 
and with plenty of no's and saying, no, you do it, I'd use the best weapon in my arsenal. I'd call mommy. <laughs> I would call my mom. And I would say, mom, tell him to put the toys away because he played with them. And most of the time it worked, but that's the only time I ever won because younger siblings are the favorites. And that's the only time I got away with it. But I think that Martha was going through something really similar. She told Jesus to tell, Martha, to tell Mary to help with the preparations. And I was very curious as to why, and maybe it's because Mary was already sitting at his feet, saw Jesus as an authority figure, and would listen to anything that he has to say. So she knew, if I are to tell Jesus, she will tell Mary. Uh, tell Mary. But Jesus responds with something a bit different. He, he responds with something that I don't think any of the disciples would have expected. I don't think any of us would have expected as we were reading. I think we would have been like, yeah, Mary, get, go and help get, make me food, or go help do whatever, get us prepared. But he says this, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There's only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. So I want to use a red frog's illustration for this. So I've just got back from rage. It was crazy. Like, um, the things I saw, like God did some incredible things. And if you want to know a bit more, uh, come chat to me afterwards. I'd love to share some stories. But when you go to Red Frogs, we basically have like this team. So you get this person who runs the location. So I, ra- I was running Belito. Then you, I have a core team around me, like guys who would be praying for people, like the pastoral people. And then the people that were good at operational can tell people what to do. They would lead the shifts. And then you've got team leaders who led teams of about four to six people. Now, these four to six people would each get it. They have to stay together the whole time. They get put into a house or a flat or an apartment, and they have to live together for seven days or eight days together. Now, if you, like, I, I'm not even going to get into that, but they have to live together. And in their off time, when they actually get to be at home, when they're not making pancakes for people, when they're not catching vomit in a bag, or they're walking people home late at night, they are either sleeping, or they should be, resting, which they don't. Uh, we have to always have conversations with them. They should be eating, which they do a lot of, and then they should be cleaning up their flats and cleaning up their pancake stuff, or they need to be making batter and getting ready for a pancake shift where they're going to go make pancakes at people's houses for them. Or they should be spending some time with God in the, in, in, like, in the corner. It doesn't have to be in the corner. It can be wherever you want, but reading your Bible, just praying and asking Jesus, like, what's he doing in their hearts during the time and praying for the matrix. Now, you get some really interesting personalities that come to Red Frogs because it's people from different churches and different backgrounds, and you always get the one person that loves Jesus so much that it's inspiring. Like, I had three of them in my team, and what happens is you end up doubting if you even know God. Like, God felt invisible for me when I was there. And you're like, oh, you guys are so inspiring. So when you're busy preparing better, when you're cleaning... You see old whoever sitting in the corner there, like just worshiping God, sitting at his feet, reading the Bible, praying, and you're like, oh, what a good person. Like they, they're spending time with Jesus. Like he's probably praying for me. Like I'm just going to, I'm not going to disturb them. They're sitting at Jesus' feet. I'm going I'm to clean up. I've got this. But after five days, when you're tired, when you're sick of the vomit, when you don't have any more food in your house, and all the other things, all the emotions that come with it, You see that same person sitting in the corner doing what they were doing the whole week while you're cleaning up, and you're like, how dare they? How dare they spend time with Jesus and not help me get prepared for later? And as I was sitting with this, I was like, that's happened to me before. I was the person blaming, not reading my Bible. But I was like, how how weird and how like hectic is it that we would get so annoyed with people spending time with Jesus. I, I couldn't wrap my head around it. Now, I understand that there's a time and there's a place for everything where people need to be cleaning the dishes, where they need to be doing this, but how, how often do we get upset when we're preparing and we're serving and we get upset with the people who are busy worshiping Jesus? So often that happens. And going back to the scripture, Jesus says that there's only one thing to be concerned about, and Mary's found it, and it will never be taken away from her. So now as I'm reading, I'm like, okay, Jesus, it's probably you. But then I proceed to keep reading the book of Luke. Spoiler alert, Jesus dies, okay? And then then he rises from the dead. Flip, man, this book's crazy. And then he disappears. He goes to heaven. 
So I was like, Jesus, surely you can't be the thing that was, not person, that was left with Mary. So what was left with Mary? And as I reflected more on this, reflected more on this it dawned on me. It was the words that Jesus had spoken to Mary that it, she had, he had taught Mary while she was sitting at his feet. And I think that is the answer to the question I said earlier, hey God, where are you? Why are you invisible? I think the answer is we must reflect on the words of Jesus found in this book. Found in this book. Now, I believe we're all in the Martha category. We get so distracted by Christmas. We get so distracted by life. We get distracted by, like, with our jobs, our children, our friends, the gym, uh, buying presents, all the things that we forget the most important person or part of our life, not part of our life, Jesus. We forget to be reflecting on what he says every single day. I believe we need to shift from being a distracted Martha and adopt an attitude of Mary where we sit at Jesus' feet listening to his words and reflecting what he has to say and applying it to our lives. So theory is all great. You can speak around that. But I really want to give you a practical handle of how we can do this. And I think it's simple. Not easy, but it's simple. How we do this is we get stuck into this book. We get stuck into Scripture, stuck into the Bible. Now, I know there's like people have a bad relationship with this thing because it's been used to like bring harm to the world and et cetera, et cetera. But this is where we have to be spending time reflecting on Jesus' words. Some people can't even get this book in the world without being, having death threats. People before this was even written didn't even have this, and they could only cling on to a few words that Jesus had ever said. But how blessed are we that we have a whole book that points towards him and he, his words are in it. Now, I want to preface something before I get into it. I struggle to read the Bible, honestly, and I'm supposed to be a pastor. Like, uh, I, I struggle to read the Bible. Why? Because I get super distracted. I have this amazing game on my phone. It's called Clash Royale, if you know it. If you don't, I'll tell you about it afterwards. But I get to like five people and I get excited. It's like chess in a way. And I'm like, oh, Bible, Clash Royale, Clash Royale. And I play, and my phone dies, my battery dies, or my, when my phone dies, then I'm like, okay, what can I do now? Oh, Netflix. So I go to Netflix. Oh, there's some cool movies. Oh, Christmas movies. Don't like Christmas movies. A series. Oh, a great series coming out. And I can watch the whole series. Then when I get bored of the series, then I'm like, okay, what can I do now? My phone's charged, but I don't want to play Clash Royale. I'm going to go to the gym. My foot's better. I'm healed now. Well, not healed almost, but... I can go to the gym and I can watch Netflix on my phone while I walk on the treadmill, which I do. It's a great tip. You should do that. Um, so now I'm, I'm finding every excuse and distraction that pulls me away from actually spending quality time with God and reflecting on what he has to say. And it saddens me because I, I think that not only I struggle with this, I think our whole generation, our whole who we are struggle with this. We all get distracted. We're living in one of the most distracted times in history. Do you agree? What, I, what I've heard, and I, and I know there's stats somewhere and I, I couldn't get them, uh, but I, I have heard it a lot in different sermons and people speaking, but we're the most biblically illiterate generation of our time, meaning that we don't engage with Scripture as much as the generations before us. And, and that really breaks my heart. And other people say, like, I, and often people will say to me, they'll be like, hey, Dil, like, I can't, I'm, I'm not hearing from God, he feels so distant, he feels, he feels, invisible, he feels invisible. And I, and I just go, hey, like, I just... Ask this question because I'd ask it to myself. I'm like, have you have you opened this book lately? Like, have you tried to seek what he has to say? And they're like, no. And then I'm like, well, no wonder God's not speaking. Now I'm not saying that the only place to find God is in the Bible, because I believe everything is spiritual. We can see the Holy Spirit reveals Himself to us in nature, through people, through anything. Like God, everything is spiritual. But I believe this is one of the best ways that we can reflect on the words of Jesus all recorded in one place, that people gave their lives to make sure that this book got put together and translated for us so that we could understand it. So why wouldn't we reflect on something that has been God-breathed and God-given to us and so easily accessible? So today, 
I want to share a way in which I've learned to engage with Scripture. One of my mentors taught me this way. And especially when I came to faith, this was one of the ways that I started to try and practice. And I go through seasons, but I feel like it's the best one that I've ever used. And I want to share with, it, with you today because often I hear people say, oh, do, I don't know where to start in the Bible. Like, do I start at Genesis and read the whole way through? And I'm like, well, you can do that if you want to. Um, but like, where do I start? How do I start? How do I read the Bible? Um, how do I read? And I'm like, I don't know if I can help you with that. But the, the method, the way that I want to teach you today, it's a five-step method called the Swedish Bible Study Method. Now, it's not in Swedish, so you find it's in English, but it's just called, I don't know why it's called that, but it is. But there are a few prerequisites, and I encourage you to write this down if you've got your phone or you've got anything. And I, I think these tools will really help you. But the prerequisites which you need are, you need to first carve out time. Because when we carve out time and we put it in our calendar, we prioritize it. We can't fit God in, in this time of wanting to read Scripture into our busy schedule. We need to build our busy schedule around it. So the first thing is you need to carve out time, however long, 10 minutes, 5 minutes, 15 minutes, 2 hours, if you're one of those people, like great, um, one of those. Then you need a Bible. I don't know how you're going to do this. You need a Bible. You need a journal, and I encourage getting a journal because when we write stuff down, I know when I study, like there's proof that when you write stuff down, like it, it, you remember it. It sits in your memory and it sits on your heart. And then you need a pen, because if you don't have a pen, then you can't write. And then the, thing, the last prerequisite is that you need to then pee, pee, uh, pick a piece of Scripture. Now, often we like, want to pee, pick these long pieces out. But hey, what, what about if we picked out, for example, the Mary and Martha story, which is four verses, and we see what God's going to do with that. Say, so, are you ready for step one? Hey, step one. It's not, the, it's not the silver bullet, but it's one way that I think could really help you. So step one is called the light bulb moment or the light bulb step. So you're reading scripture and something just shines out to you. You know, like when you read it, there's always one thing that really grips you. And I believe God, when we, when we read in scripture, that he always reveals some new stuff to us, like fresh new perspectives, or he reminds us of stuff that we've already forgotten. So the question, the first thing to ask and then to write down is, what stuck out to you in the passage? What really shone or shined? I don't know where, but what shone out, shined out? I need to work on English. The second step is the question mark step. I feel like I always get stuck here. But what happens is you ask yourself, do I not understand anything that is in, in this particular uh, passage? So, for example, I didn't really understand what preparations Mary might be doing, and I didn't know what Jesus was like, wh who, what would you leave with Mary? What won't be taken away from her? So, you proceed to read other parts of Scripture, and you start to see what may be. So, read this verses before to get a bit of context, or read a bit after to see if there's anything that's revealed. So, it gives you a better understanding of what you're reading. Now, if you can't find anything, and like me, and I'm always dumb, and I can't figure it out, I'm like, God, please help me, is go and you go use resources like Google, type it in, and ask, Why did, what did Martha have to prepare? I literally do that. And then, what didn't, what, didn't, what didn't leave Mary? What did Jesus leave with Mary? And I would start going to these commentaries, which are books that are written that help you understand Scripture. I do research, and I try to understand the text as a whole, so that I can understand the context and I don't take it at face value. And then I really understand it. So you write that on the side. You don't put that at all in your notes. Then the third step, this is my favorite one. It's called the cross step. And you ask, how did this piece of scripture point towards Jesus? Because essentially this book is all pointing towards Jesus. And what did I learn about his character? What did I learn about him as a person? So you start jotting that down. So, Because when you're in relationship, when you're with somebody, when you're with friends, you start to begin to learn who they are. And that's how trust builds, and that's how your relationship fosters. Once you've written that down, you go to the step four, which is the arrows step. So the arrow step is basically applying what you've now read in the Scripture. So you can ask questions like, hey, what is God teaching me in the Scripture? Well, when I was reading it, that, wow. Jesus really wants us to sit at his feet and to reflect on his words and to listen to him. Or you can ask the question, um, what is God trying to tell me to stop doing? Or what is he trying to correct in my thinking or my behavior? Like, what is he trying to do to make me more Christ-like, to make me more like Jesus? And then you write that down. And once you've processed all of that, you do a more practical one where you don't have to write anything down. And you, and you go through the talking bubble stage. Um, like, you know, like in the comics, like the talking bubble so this is when you get a person, uh, you can get any kind of person you want, like someone preferably close, or, and, and you choose to share what you reflected on with them. 
So you choose, hey, do I need to share what I reflected on with somebody because they really need to hear it? Like this could really speak into their life. Therefore, it builds some courage in you and you actually get to process what you get to say what you processed. Or you get someone who you can remain accountable to. So for example, like, like I'll tell uh, my girlfriend Ash how like, God's revealing some stuff to me, or I'll tell my small group of guys, like, hey, this is what God's revealing to me. Now just be careful, because when you get an accountability person, they're going to hold you to it. Like with my small group, I'm like, yeah, you know, God's convicting me so much, man. Like I really need to pray more. And I get a voice note every morning and every evening from my mate session saying, have you prayed today? <laughs> and then now I'm like, I can't lie. <laughs> I have to tell them the truth, and then I'm like, okay, let me pray, and I pray. And it really just helps when we can, we can live out the thing that we feel the Holy Spirit has uh, revealed to us in Scripture about Jesus. Now, if you didn't write that all down, I'm not that mean. I'm going to put the link up to this Bible study method on our Facebook community group. So if you're not on there, I encourage you to go join it. It's the Riverside Facebook community group. Um, but at the end of the day, friends, I believe we need to prioritize this practice of reflection in our life. And I say it's a practice because a discipline feels too formal, and it feels like you can never fail, but a practice, we're continuously working at it to get better. I believe if we do this, one, these are one of the tools, but if we reflect on the words of Jesus, it will help us engage with who He is, and it will help us grow in, his, in our relationship with Him, and it will help Him to become more visible to us, which is the one question that we're seeking out. So let's be a generation, let's be a people that shift the stats of being the most biblically illiterate to a people who were known, the future generations will say, they were known for sitting at the feet of Jesus, for sitting there and listening and clinging onto his every word and reflecting onto his every word. Can we do that? I, so now, I want to leave you with this. Don't, don't wait for the New Year's resolutions to start this. Like, I'm, I'm so convicted by this thing. If I'm going to not start it now, I'm never going to start it. So let's go home today or tomorrow and let's carve our time intentionally so that when we get to the new year, we're off running. That we would build our life around reflecting on the words of Jesus and reflecting with him. Can we do that? Who's in? I'm in. Let me pray.